All right, here we are again, greeting you from Nippy, New Hampshire. <laughs> I can't think of any other way to describe it uh, today, and I'm dressed for it, so uh, we should be good. Seems to me Mr. Producer went to a camp called Toe and Nippy, and I wonder if that had anything to do with cold toes. Feels like a good title for a camp, a winter camp. Hmm. All right, um, I have something from Steve, uh, who I don't think I've seen you before, Steve. And uh, so Steve Chmylar, as your name comes across. Uh, but let me first um, let me first just thank uh, our uh, uh, Lauren K, recurring donor. Thank you for being one of the steady people that makes this possible. Uh, you know, I guess it's going to be possible anyway, but it's it's a cheer and it's a help actually to do this, uh, so we don't wind up being totally sacrificial <laughs> in the process. So thank you, Laura Kay, and also Capit Art, and that's the Theodora. Theodora, Theodora I have your uh, message here. I'm looking at it uh, about um, uh, AI and that sort of thing, and I'm not prepared to do anything on that, but I'm going to come back to that subject, just so you know. But in any case, thank you again for that nice donation. Much appreciated. And your nice comments, too. Always, always sweet kind. Um, let's, um, let's get to Steve right away. And I, so I'm trying to put two videos on one video card. So I don't want to rush anybody or including myself. I don't want to do an inadequate job, but uh, let's see what they got for us today. Uh, all right. One subject I do not hear addressed often is how the choice of subject matter <clears throat> influences the painting style. And I would love to hear your um, thoughts on this. I want to say somebody out there recommended I get some ginger into my throat, and I I didn't do that today. So here I am drinking something that might have even a tiny bit of milk in it, and it's probably going to make my throat rumblier. But if you don't mind putting up with that for now, uh, it'll, I suspect it'll come back. So painting style, the influence of subject matter, does it influence the painting style? That's such a, a big question, a very interesting one. When you're a young painter, it's very, very... Um, uh, challenging in a way that you know, makes you makes you sort of want to get into the game. You know, can you paint in multiple styles and that sort of thing? But so it depends on what you mean by painting style. You'll see that most people throughout history have have painted in uh, 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 a particular way. You could see their fingerprint on it. Uh, you know, there, somebody was a Stevens or somebody said you ought to be able to judge, a good painter should be able to judge from a sketch, even a scribble by, by one of the great artists of the past and know who did it. Uh, well, that's how heavy your fingerprints are on your stuff. So you're sort of stuck with something like that. And you do have to figure out painting. And, you, you know, figuring out painting does include figuring out, you have to make pictures and you and your process of make, figuring out painting and making pictures, making pictures, eventually you come to best practice, what I call best practices. But those practices are based already on a tendency within you, a, a certain kind of a love. If you're not a, if you're not a, if you don't, if you love form more than color, you probably will have a different look. Uh, if your uh, if your thing is 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 light, it you know, and and I'm talking about Boston School guys. You're going to be painting. You're going to find different ways of working. More comment, more more adaptable with that, but also your subject matter and everything are going to be somehow or other interrelated with it. And I, you know that gets back to the question of art in the sense of life. And if you haven't read Ayn Rand on that, Ayn Rand guys, <laughs> these guys want me to, <laughs> to pronounce it, not Ayn. Ayn Rand, the um, the uh, ex uh, Russian um, the American philosopher. Um, uh, but that's her. That's, she makes a couple commentaries in um, the Romantic Manifesto, and but among other things, she makes a point that your work does exude your sense of life. So that has to do with what choices you made in creating what you would call a style. And again, I I think the word style is a very heavy-handed thing. We you know, and and people want to do a showy thing just for a stunt and nobody's done this before, you know, and in that way. But um, so that's already there. So the question is, do you really change? So I wanted to spend today, do you really change 
styles per se. But I think you mean something bigger, and I'm going to talk about something just more broadly to show how how subject matter does influence or has a potential and maybe ought to influence, not just maybe, ought to influence your um, your um, uh, things related to what we would call style. You know, the color scheme you pick, um, the kinds of marks you make and things like that. So I'll get right into that. But let's just read the rest of it so you've heard it. Uh, artists who are painting landscapes and portraits are dealing with known forms, hair, trees, etc., that don't require excess detail for the viewer to understand what they're observing. If an imaginative realist is designing a composition from lesser known elements, is their hand not forced to render more detail in order to communicate what story they are telling? Now, is that a stylist, stylistic thing to have more detail? So it's an interesting thing, and I stylistic, yeah. So, but let's 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 hang back with that one first. Let's let's not deal with that one yet. Uh, I want to go there, but the one thing that uh, Steve talks about here is the imaginative painter, and everything I'm addressing today, I think, except for some maybe sidebars, or is going to be about the imaginative painter. Subject is the thing for the illustrator, right? You're told to paint something that has to do with the story that's been written. Um, or you're so heavily tied to narrative, you know. You have a theme. You have the, you have a Greek theme. You have a, you have a, um, um, uh, you know, a, an Arthurian theme or something like that. And um, and then you make your picture, and it's organized around the story. And yeah, so of course the answer to that would be, of course, if you're you you want to be organizing around the story, and but more than the story, right? So let's just look at it. I picked these two right at the beginning, and um, guys, this isn't going to be exhaustive because it would exhaust me to be exhaustive, <laughs> but it's going to be, there's going to be enough, I think, to, to get you a hint of what we're talking about and the ways this can go, but it's not exhaustive in the sense that I'm not going to tell you every little thing you want to see or hear. Um, so I'm showing you two draftsmen, and I'm not, this is not going to be primarily about drawing or based on drawing, but um, I'm showing you Millet and his subject. And Degas, and his subjects, Degas is the dancer. She's resting. But it's got a feminine, grace-based thing, this Degas one does. The other, the one above is 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 rough. Um, it suggests the life in the dirt, you know, the life of the farm, the life, you know. So his, and his whole uh, body of work is that of the worker. Now, so much so that people had this idea that he was a socialist and he wasn't even close to being a socialist. He said so. <laughs> but... Um, he, but he, but he was brought up in a in a rural, and um, you know, sort of land survival uh, background, and 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 he saw people work hard, and he had this. It somehow it thrilled him, I think, or you know, did something. Um, uh, it, it inspired him, though, and, it, and so it was. It was one of the things that made his subject right. So, um, and and he repeats it over and over again. So would his original choices, if he's, if you sense that he's going that way, be, um, you know, like in this direction? You know, um, so he's taking, he's blocking in a big figure, you know, a mass figure. And, he, and he's saying things like, so the expression is with the figure, right? So, he, so it's about men working, women working, you know, or kids doing whatever kids do. And, you know, so on. it goes on. But it is the life close to the land and all that sort of stuff. But to go out here, you know, it's a different thing, a fine point and all that sort of stuff. I'm just saying that to show you that there is going to be a, a, a um, an initial energy that may already be based on your, uh, you know, um, your uh, inclinations and your 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 drives. Degas went through some stages where he was, he was doing some things that are. Um, Paintings that are, um, you know, realism and, and stuff like that. But it obviously, over time, wasn't him. He was clearly more comfortable in the world of, of, of the ballet and the and the and the um, and the, and the um, horse races and stuff like that. I mean, he does it seems to me he does his most significant work there. Um, although, you know, when he talks about the figure, there's a certain kind of a thing that he does, and he even even. Um, uh, almost apologizes for it later in his life, but uh, turning 
women into into just being a document of, of literally how a person might look taking a bath, not trying to get an ideal form or gesture or any of those kinds of things. So his motives are definitely somewhere more sometimes like to God, but let's just go on and think well, how else this works. I don't want to get, again, I have to do this in probably a somewhat abbreviated way. So here I'm showing you Millet and Bouguereau and a similar thing, but it's in painting. Now both of them appreciate light, although I think Millet is the more impressionistic, the more, more the greater appreciator of light itself. Uh, the Bouguereau work almost always looks like it was done in a studio. So that may be a, a thing, but again, there's these crudeness of marks. Uh, it's, I mean, you wouldn't say this is crude drawing. It's pretty, pretty, pretty articulate drawing, but it's, uh, it's more broadly expressed. It's, it's, um, whereas this looks like it's, you know, it's a it's got a princess theme. Everybody's having a happy life. They get out to go out in the woods a little bit. These people live in the dirt, right, so to speak. And so the question is, would we handle paint differently, depending on those things? And of course, the answer is obvious. You would not. Doesn't mean. Doesn't mean. I mean, Millet's work is fairly. You know, surrounds this. So how much does he change stylistically ever? He doesn't really. His subject is almost never this thing I'd call grace. It never really is. The subject is, or, or even the mood, you know. Um, but the idyllic of Bouguereau, you know, idyllic, you know, clean and beautiful lines and an and, and, and idyllic atmosphere of the land, you know, the sun and sky. You know, this area over in this Millet one looks almost parched. Another you know, thing. <laughs> looks like a, looks like a, a fairly typical, um, rural farm scene. I, I remember working on a farm that made me think this way, made me see, that I that looked this way to me. But, um, so, so let me just say what I'm trying to do here. I'm going to say that there are so many tools you have that we could call style, but they are really approaches to stuff. So what I really want to talk about is, is elements that are, as it were, stylistic. Let me just blank through a few of these, but what I'm talking, showing you here is two paintings, one by, oh gee, I apologize sincerely. This says Millet and Degas. I so apologize, guys, I'll have to change that at some point, but this is, um, this is uh, Benson and this is Tarbell. <laughs> Shocking, like, how in the heck did I do that? Oh, golly, Paul. Um, I'm not stopping the video to fix it, Mr. Producer. If you want to fix it. <laughs> Um, all right, so, but what you can see they're doing here is they're using patterning, so what we call spots, and they're creating a visual impression based on spots. Did the subject matter make them do that? Well, sure, on some level. I mean, <laughs> I don't know why he put her in front of this screen, but he, but at some point there is a connection between what the figure is doing and what all this stuff is doing that is what you would call stylistic. Tarbell doesn't paint on an everyday basis with these big flat patterns and this almost Art Nouveau, Art Deco sort of reach. And I think Art Nouveau more like it. Uh, and Benson isn't, this isn't typical of Benson. He does a lot of this spot stuff. But, um, but you can see there's something about the day and you know, all that sort of stuff and his desire to show the, you know, the, it's, it's the atmosphere, the air, the, the, the people out in the wild. <laughs> it's a hunting scene. These guys are waiting for some birds to come in. And um, so, and so, yeah, um, the, the, simple, the lack of sort of fine detail in this picture is major blobs, not a lot of fine stuff. Yeah, does that have to do with the subject? You know, what does it say about the subject? But again, remember that what you're doing with your, when you say what you're saying about your subject, does your subject demand it? What is what you're saying about your subject that demands it? Sometimes mood, um, and this does convey a pretty good mood thing, but sometimes it might be something more like, like, like you, know, you found the girl intriguing, yeah, and this really sort of went with her beautifully the way you thought of her mind. And knowing her well as your daughter or whatever, uh, that was just like wholly appropriate to the poetry of the portrait of the sitter, you know? So you see what I'm, you see where I'm going? You know, you've had these thoughts before. I'm, I'm showing you again that other people use flat patterning. Now, this is not a different kind of flat patterning. We're going to talk about flat in the next video, actually. I probably should have done that one first, but maybe not. But um, 
the um, this is a Persian one. Gamal at one point had done a drawing and then a painting of archers. And I don't know if he'd seen this, but he must have. But they're doing exactly the same thing in a square picture, shooting down this way. They just happen to be modern, you know, guys, you know, people of his time, the models of the day. Uh, but Gamel loved pattern. And you see Uccello, these pattern, what I mean by pattern, some of you people use the word graphic, I believe, to describe it. And you mean something, I think, postery. And Gamel was into that. You know, Gamel was doing something that was, he was trying to create symbols and plant flat patterns in front of you. And they take on that, like a kind of a symbolic quality. Now, does your subject require that? Is that, is that suit the subject, you know? You wouldn't do that every day. I mean, we're always aware of patterning in all pictures, and in a, in a, in a uh, like, like the portrait just before on the right, you know, you you wouldn't necessarily just think, oh, I'm gonna do a patterny picture, but something would compel you. So if you're doing a landscape, there'd be something about the landscape that would say, do me, you know, do it this way, you know, I'm just, the, and that's what happened with the Benson. He just saw the, the spotting and he thought, no, this is wild, you know, and he saw a picture in it, meaning, but, but what is it, you know, because, and, and what did it convey, so? What does it convey by doing that? Does that convey this sort of atmospheric wildness? You're out there in the middle of some water and <laughs> whatever. So, but you can see the Uccello, uh, who's in some de degrees uh, the uh, father of uh, perspective, the Renaissance painter. But you can see this cutout stuff. It's very um, um, almost childlike, you know. Uh, very interesting and very, very in a certain way, the simplicity of it is very beautiful, very attractive. What subject says do that? Now, Uccello just did that all the time. Would Uccello would suddenly switch and become a different kind of painter? I doubt that you have time in life to do all that. And yet I'm going to surprise you by showing you what Aang does. And Aang, Aang is just into this thing, this other thing called style. But I just want you to look at that use of pattern. Sometimes it's almost purely abstract, the gamma, and, and sometimes the shape just simply is made out of the, the pattern is made out of the, um, the figure itself, just all by itself. But here's Gamble making a pattern out of clouds. But you can see he's just, he's into this thing and he loved talking about invented, you know, these kinds of inventions of pattern inventions. But you can see this very patterny flat thing really beautifully working. By the way, in our next video, which we're going to talk about with flat, um, the discussion of flat, and uh, um, this, this suits that very nicely, doesn't it? Where you can see great masses. The darks are form basically a flat mass. The midtones form a big patterny flat. And the lights form a different one. Big flat value units. Keep it in mind for the next video. <laughs> All right, so we've, we've looked at that. So was Uccello going to go over and suddenly become this kind of painter? The answer is no way in the world, obviously. And those guys, you, you can't get out of your own skin. But there are these different things that one can always do. And, um, and in our times, because we have so much background, you should be able to do the Bougaro thing or the Uccello um, Persian Gamel type thing. You know what I mean? You should be able, you should have that, you should have awareness of that. And notice when that is the poetry that suits best your subject. So, <laughs> I'd love to, I should skip this one, but I'm not going to. I'm, I'm just going to plow through it the way I put it, put it here. I wasn't tired when I did this, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm thinking, I, boy, there's different things I might have done. All right, now look what I'm saying to you about. So drawing, I'm putting this down here to show you that drawing is one of those things that you can use in different ways stylistically. Now, this is a funny thing to me that you're looking at something that looks like it would have been done in the Renaissance. This thing looks like it could have been done by a Greek. It could, looks like it could be the Parthenon frieze. Well, do you see the difference in the subject matter? This is this is Raphael in the foreign arena. This is a Renaissance picture. This this is the, the apotheosis of Homer. <laughs> so it's a Greek celebration. And he just stylizes like heck, based obviously on the modeling in the Parthenon, primarily in my view. But then look down here on the left corner and look at the stylization that's going on here. Isn't this wild? This is Persian. This is Persian art, now, a kind of Persian art. I don't know what to send you to to go look online, but you will find the very interpretation, even of the little pinky and the way it's turned up, it is not an uncommon thing in certain, now I say Persian, I apologize to all you guys from that part of the country who know, and I'd be happy, by the way, if you'd send me a better name for that phase. But when you see this, 
So, the, so he's doing these very flat things. Everything is flat cutouts in here. Now here you've got considerably more depth, and this looks sculptural. This is Ang. Ang is the master craftsman of style when it comes to an ideal, right? A Greek ideal, a, a, a Renaissance ideal, and a Persian ideal. He actually had a grasp of the idea of ideal. But ideal doesn't mean the ideal thing for everybody, you know. It means the, the Greek ideal, you know, and, the, uh, and so on. You follow? But you know this, I think. So now we're looking at Jerome to just to compare. Jerome above. This is the Yang that we just looked at. Look at the Jerome. You see that there's, it just looks like Western painting of, a, of an Eastern subject, right? Of a Mid-Eastern subject. And that's all it is. This looks like Persian art, or at least it looks like a fellow traveler with Persian art, right? And it's, but that's a thing that one can do. He, and he did a different odalisk in which she looks considerably more European, but she still does. He looks like he's halfway to getting to where this is. But this, this is really impressive. Even the color scheme is heavy with that um, sense of the Oriental art. Not of the Orient, not necessarily. I mean, nothing wrong with Jerome's interpretation. Let's say his, in fact, his, he had photographs and all sorts of stuff of these, this architecture that was used, and he had people try to, um, um, and it looks like actually in some ways not so well, to actually uh, um, um, create the architecture, uh, I mean, architectural draftsmen, create the architecture for him. But, so these are poetic things, right? The odalisk here, is just, you start saying, oh man, like that. Just like, you just real people and real, you know. It's one of the problems I think that Jerome begins, he's part of right at the beginning. You see that Leighton actually has a, a tendency to idealize virtually everything in the Greek ideal. But Jerome is, and Bougro and others are part of this movement that has a heavy hand, that has a heavy, almost, you'd say a burden of almost photography that's beginning to come into painting. So how are we doing for time? All right, I think I may have enough time to get through here. Now, so here with color, right? These are the things that obviously anybody can do, no matter what style of drawing or what, are, what, what patterning sort of form, whether you're formy and lost and found like this guy, which is very different from those cutouts. Whether you're more cut out like, like um, Parrish, Maxfield Parrish. Uh, this is Spear, by the way, Arthur Spear. I mentioned him to you before, but he creates this whimsical, impressionistic things. And, but you can see the feeling of it's different, the coolness of this, this high mountain coolness coming across here. And this, 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 the warmth of this, you just bake in the sun all day, this is like this complete romance, you know. <laughs> and you can see the expression is very different because of the general peachiness of this scheme and the general coolness of this one. And here, this much more sinister. And there's, again, it's the color scheme. It's not just the color scheme, but the value scheme, the darkening down of the whole thing and greening it and, and lostness. Now, I'm, I'll introduce you to that in the next one. But these are things that will have impact on your statement so that you're not actually changing styles. <laughs> As a student, I did, I mentioned to you before too, that I, that I made a, um, a, 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 an imaginative painting under Gamble with Jason and the Golden Fleece as the assignment. And, um, and I'll, I'll be doing something like that soon with some of my people here. But um, that, that is um, the mistake. I, when I decided to color and I said, all right, let's make an impressionist color. What do I know? And I had, a, I had a play to that. So I laid it in and it just looked as stupid as heck. It was totally inappropriate. First of all, to, the, to what I perceived to be what I was trying to say, you know, what, what was needing to be said and from my perspective i was trying to show some of the 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 uh a scale of intimidation that this woman must have suffered trying to trying to give the sleeping dope potion to to the to the dragon <laughs> and this impression of stuff it like a happy day in the woods <laughs> totally wrong kind of approach to color pretty lights so what do you do, do you need to create a stormy day probably a moody day uh, cloudy, whatever, all that stuff. But you can see how that's obviously the case. And there's no reason not to talk about it. We all think about it. When we do pictures like this, Impressionism is different. You're drawing all your inspiration from what's sitting in front of you, drawing it directly out of it. So here's Degas and Jerome. And I'm saying here now that composition can be a massive factor in, uh, in um, 
uh, your statement. And so Degas is doing ballet, and I'm getting this feeling, when you look at this, like if you just start looking at these funny little bits of faces here, you're feeling like you almost can hear the, the toes going, dit, 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 ba, 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 dit, 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 and they're running out. <laughs> you can almost, you almost feel the ballet. Do you know, and, and there's this wild little run through this thing. Now, that's a, that's a compositional that's a compositional reach, right? So you might say he's created a great sense of the gesture. Well, Jerome down below has done something rather similar with, um, with the, uh, uh, you know, that death of Caesar. These guys, a bunch of these guys are all murdering Caesar. And uh, I don't know who's in the back of the Brutus or whatever is over there. Um, of no help at all. <laughs> uh, but this is, a, this is much more sinister, you know, and has, you know, it's, it's it feels, it feels, you know, the drive through it, the color through it, all this sort of stuff. It just feels like a a, a mad, dark film noir kind of moment. Um, so it's all the content, you know. It's the values, it's the design. It's a similar drive and dri design in a certain way. There's a drive through this thing that sweeps through here. A very beautiful line, excellent line, but it keeps on popping in these sinister elements, and in certain ways. Uh, uh, so, so in design, even the choice of where you put things, how big things are, and they create a sense of scale and all those sorts of things. But the values of the painting and all that. So all those things, they always must be there. It's in your, they're part of your consideration. Most, most Western painters don't do it as, they don't dig in as long as they should or would. I think sometimes that's one of the things that happens when you don't get into, when you get into having to hurry up projects or wanting to do so many in a period of time. You don't give each one enough necessarily. So that'd be a thing to be thoughtful about. So I'm mentioning here, I've already talked about Chiaroscuro in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in this one by Degas. And you could see that there's some of that in here. It's, it's, he's not as heavy into it, but he's, he's, got a, he's got a bit of it here in that heavy cloud feeling of this thing coming down here, lostness in different areas. They do. What do they indicate, right? They indicate something rather sinister, you know, something... Mystery, sinister. So in each of these cases, these are Wyeths, both of these. This is this is the opium den of some Western guys getting in there. And this this guy who's giving him the pot, he's the dealer, right? <laughs> it's not pot, it's it's opium, but but there, and there's the dragon, you know, I mean everything. And now so that could be a symbol of whatever. But do you see how sinister the coloring is? I mean, and by the way, this is somewhat in the direction of the real coloring. <laughs> None of these things ever can be dependent on. This one, these these two are both also somewhat similar to that in color. But again, that chiaroscuro thing, you know, you're not just doing cutouts around, you know, like the, like, like, like um, the, Greek, the Greek model that um, is being used by, by Ang. These aren't just outline figures standing side by side. Uh, Leighton does a very similar thing. He's making use of what, the lostness to create mystery. And he's using, in that case of Alexander here, he's using this dismalness to create that sense of mood that she's dismal. Now, the grace, the beautiful grace of this line here, that's a feminine thing, if you want to say it like that. This, is, this interpretation over here is much more earthy. But the great line itself is very, very empathetic to the, to the fineness, shall we say, of, of emotion, of the, maybe even the emotion of love. You could say that. What is he trying to say with that? Now, it's one of those things. And your problem is going to be to get your poetry across and make a great group of patterns or, or a great main line and a great, great unity of, of not just color, but et cetera, et cetera, line, et cetera. So, but you can see that each of these is doing a different thing. This creates a very warm environment. And there's a painting for that and there's a painting for an icier one. This is much more threatening environment being icy like that. I don't know why that is. And this one is somewhere in between this cave-like feeling here. This is, feels like a cave too. It doesn't feel as threatening. I have no idea whether it ought to feel, but I look closer at it. Uh, but <laughs> so, and then of course there's more use of chiaroscuro. This is Leslie Thompson. I've showed you this guy's a number of times, and uh, but you can see that it creates a sense of mystery. And there's the Buddha, and so of course that's a thing, isn't it? Where you think, oh, huh, because all religions have this certain thing that turns into mystery. Why the monkey and all that sort of stuff is fascinating, you know, that creates an interesting thing. But this is as magical as lost and found pictures kind of get with in the general first impression of it. And, uh, and then again, in the Rembrandt, you know, it's almost like the mystery of the mind, the, the loss of the lack of knowledge. This, this guy here is like the philosopher or he's, he, he's meditating or whatever. 
But this is the mind and the light coming in, the guy searching for light and all this darkness. Reminds me of the Middle Ages a little bit, you know, thinking of, or the ages around the Renaissance that Rembrandt just comes out of. But, um, but then there's the warm hearth over here. And so there's different kinds of um, actual content. But the overall thing is the, if you want to, it's sort of a mystery of life and very internalized. But how much of that's being done because of the values, but the curling up of the stairs, what a, what a gift for this guy. You know, what, you know, you're talking about the winding into the mind or, you know, into the recesses of your, uh, you know, up and up, up and up and up and away, you know. So that's, you know, each one of these things is contributing. So it's, it's you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying you're right. And it's, and it's great to talk about these things, right? <laughs> now, I'm just going to go run back to your, um, to your comment at the beginning and see if what, I've, what I haven't talked about yet, and we can bring that up and maybe use a picture. But if you're, so he says, if you're an imaginative, okay, now he talks about excess details, goes back into talking about detail. If you're an imaginative realist in designing a composition from lesser known elements, is their hand not forced to render more detail in order to communicate what story they're telling? Now, there's a type of detail, but not necessarily more detail. I'd say in the whole history of Western art, there is virtually no, as it were, more detail. You're always trying to do with as little as possible. And it's, and, it, and, it's, and, and most paintings aren't going to tolerate you walking into them and looking at all sorts of little junk. If you, lose, if you haven't communicated your basic theme before that, there are, you're not going to have an audience, uh, not much of one. Now, that's true, there are people that walk around the museum and only look at the details and never see the picture. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Maybe they're, they're your friends. <laughs> so I don't think that's an, I don't think that's an ar argument. So that's something you might want to think about. But ask in defense of imaginative realism because I feel that now this is what I'm talking about. Everything you saw today was imaginative realism. I don't much like the word realism because it's it fraught with other stuff. So, but um, but knowing what, that most people mean what he means here, I t we'll leave it because I feel that many atelier painters regard tight detail inferior. But I feel the opposite. So um, in looseness and. Uh, by the way, is a means of conveying data, but fineness, articulation, a careful, crafted um, 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 every piece being carefully crafted conveys something different. And so you'll get, see what I mean? So you can say, so you're, but you're practically putting yourself, Steve, I think, in the position of saying, I'm fixed on my style, I do type detail. But I'd suggest you might consider uh, thinking about your subject when you're painting something from life, at least, and ask yourself, what is the thing that you value most in that impression? And work with that. If it happens to be these beautiful, very articulate square edges and patterning, there's one thing. But if it happens to be the great movement of color through a passage, how about that one? How about, how about do you know how to do that? Uh, you know, and... and, and you know, so the, 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 the broader expression. Nevertheless, I'm not saying any particular, I don't have any feelings about that. I, I'm not a fan of, 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 of all the details just because, you know. But, but you're talking about invented subjects. So if you have a reason and it needs more detail, do it. You must do it. Uh, I mean, the stuff that um, Amatadama does, um, I'm not showing any of that today, but the stuff that he does has an excess of detail, it seems to me, and often loses its unity because of it, and he's piecemealing it so often. I see some of that difficulty with the color in Shanks, for example, but, it's, but, but there's nothing inherently, I mean, you can draw to the nth degree anything you want, provided it's in, in order and doesn't simply become photographic so that there is no you in there anymore. <laughs> Something to think about, and especially even in imaginative work, you can wind up doing so much local detail that you'll miss that the story will get lost in that local detail, and that's something to think about. As mentioned even before, the um, now I have to stop, but is the story the um, women and swimmen, as they called it, the navy mural by by um, uh, Paxton? It isn't precisely a good model for this, but if I if I said to you that. When you look at those, you see hairdos of 30s women. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, now it's out of detail. He might have, 
might he not have tried to generalize or do something different so that they'd become the great myth? But so that's a detail that can hurt you um, in the end, you know. So I do, I, he says, I believe that invented subject matter is most difficult to do well, and it often gets a bad reputation because it's not done well. Uh, there are likely opposing philosophies. I didn't want to get into that part, Steve, as you can see. So what I've done is talk about the various ways you can get, you can get, you can address the question of, of of your, of what you're trying to convey, and how it affects um, your methodologies and your and your pro, uh, not process, but your your brush strokes. Just put it that way. Or you're thinking in general. So I've showed you a few things. I'll give you maybe give you a look at it, guys. So, all right, and I got to get out of here. Again, I want to thank you to um, uh, dear ladies Lauren uh, K and uh, and uh, Theodora for your nice uh, contributions this time. I know I'm behind in thanking people. I think I'm about eight people behind, and we've spaced them out for the next several <laughs> videos. I'm sorry, sorry to do it to you. Um, in some ways. But I do hope to get to your uh, content, uh, uh, Theodore, one day. Uh, it's not inspiring. By the way, Lauren, I know L-A-U-R-E-N. I don't know if that sometime is a man's name. So don't, uh, forgive me if I ever get that wrong. But I'm taking that, as I said. All right. Good. Have a great week. And I'll see you, I'll see you in the next video. Or you'll see me. Maybe it'd be part of the point. All right. Take care.